Uh, sorry, just a second. Can everybody see the slides? Yeah, I can. Okay, good. Sorry, I had to do a bit of an unorthodox share here. My computer's not talking to my iPad right now. Okay, then I guess we start in a moment. Good. Is there a way to do full screen? Sorry, this is the last minute, so I get, you get what you get. All right. Warren, should I just get started on the solution presentation or should I wait a moment? Second. Should I just get started? I'm flying a little blind here right now. That's great. Get started. We are on time. Okay, perfect. Then I will do that. Okay, so welcome everyone. We're going to discuss the solutions to the problems that you uh, hopefully had lots of fun addressing at this contest. Um, I'll try to keep this a little brief. These slides will be available online. Um, uh, and uh, so you can peruse them later at your leisure. There's a few details that we've expanded formulas a little bit in some cases that I'm not going to dwell on in this quick summary. First, we want to thank everybody who um, helped create and test the problems. So, so Darko is our chief judge here, but then there's also Darcy Best, Howard Chang, Ryan Farrell, myself, Brandon Fuller, and Noah Weninger were all involved with the problem creation and testing at some level. So big thanks to them. It's, it's actually kind of fun to see this uh, panel growing. Hopefully that means we continue to sustain a lot of interest in helping create problems as well in the future. Before I get started on this, just notice that there's this number at the top. This is the number before the scoreboard is frozen. So the number of teams that solved it versus the number of teams that had attempted it. But these numbers reflect before the scoreboard is frozen. Now problem A betting, um, this was strategically placed at part uh, at A just so that people had a quick one to look at and, and solve. And it's simply for each option answer 100 over P, or P is the percentage bet on that option. Now, let me pause for a second. Um, the, my current setup, I can't see the chat because because uh, I'm sharing the whole screen. I have never used an iPad for this before. Uh, so if there's any questions you'll have to, uh, that you want to ask on the fly, you'll have to verbalize them. So I hear it. Sorry. I, okay. This is uh, how I just want to say that the, the numbers on the top is the number of accepted submissions out of the number of total submissions. As the opposed total to the, sub yeah. So as opposed to the teams. Sorry. Thank you for that clarification, Howard. I got that wrong. Okay. Uh, total number of submissions versus accepted submissions before the freeze of the scoreboard. Good, so that's problem A. For uh, problem E, election paradox, uh, it's, it, it's a simple greedy algorithm. Note that you, you want to um, win the region with the highest populations, but not so much that it gives you the win. And for the remaining regions, you want to win up to just less than the majority. So you sort the regions and, um, and fully win those big ones and then win as much as you can from the other ones. And that's how how many? Um, and again, that's the solution. For social distancing, um, notice that there's kind of gaps in the circle as you go around. So for each gap of length G, where G counts the empty seats between people, you can squish this many people in the gap and still have at least one seat between them. I just try playing with this number a little bit. So just go around the entire circle, look at all the gaps and sum this value for each gap. Um, the big trick is don't forget about the gap between the last and the first person in the inputs because it's a it's a round table. It's not just a sequence. RSA mistake. Now this one we saw quite a few time limit exceeded. Uh, so let me talk about um, one of a couple of different ways you could try approaching it. I guess they're somewhat equivalent. Um, the big trick is to factor both numbers individually using trial division up to the square root, or in other words, the standard factoring algorithm um, for 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 problems like this. Do not factor the product, just factor the individual numbers themselves. If you try to factor the product by going up to the square root, well, if the input is both very large primes, that would take too long. So this would take O of root n time to factor each of the two input numbers. Um, and so 10 to the sixth time to factor one of the two numbers and do the other. 
So once you have a list of all primes between both numbers, then it's just a simple matter of applying the rules. Does a prime appear more than once? And if not, are the individual numbers themselves prime? So just remember to factor the individual numbers, not the product. And you can tell there was a lot of uh, submissions on this one, many, many time limit exceeds. Pawn shop. All right, so pawn shop, we saw again, lots of time limit exceeds because you have to be a little smart about how you do this. You have to, um, you have to, uh, you have to keep track of a little bit of extra information so that uh, you don't have to just rescan each time. So let's scan from left to right through both arrays at once. So if we imagine that this is one array, this is just like a visual representation, and this is one array, you're gonna scan through them both one at a time. What we wanna do is we wanna maintain a frequency counter of the items we've seen. Um, so there's a, maybe you can keep track of the frequency counter with two different dictionaries or just a single one that does the number of items, uh, the number of copies seen up here for it minus the number of copies seen down there. But either way, keep track of a frequency counter. And also maintain of a, of a, a value delta that indicates the, the number of items that have not been seen the same time so far. So as you update the frequency counter, make sure you update delta so you know how many items are currently not balanced between the two as you do your scan. If that ever becomes zero, place a divider. So the idea here is just to do this, um, this uh, better way of keeping track of things. So the running time would be linear in the size of the input times whatever the runtime is of the data structure you use to store the frequency counts, be it effectively constant with the hash table or log in with, this, with, um, with a map. Um, but um, the idea is just to have this single linear pass with just a few updates. Again, stop me if you have any questions, I can't see the chat. Slide count. So just simulate the algorithm. Actually, I should comment here. Slide count is one that we thought we would see a solution to earlier in the contest, but we were happy to see it eventually smooth out uh, partway through the contest. Uh, more and more people solved it. Um, it's actually not supposed to be a challenging problem. Uh, just simulate the algorithm itself, but every time S or E is incremented, let's just have a time step that counts like every time one of those is incremented. Um, so it's the number of windows you've seen so far. Now, during each step of the simulation, record when you enter and when you leave um, WI. So when you enter it and when you leave it, um, the difference between those two time timestamps is well, the number of windows that was involved. In. So you can solve this in linear time. The running time, I guess, isn't summarized here, but the running time is linear. If you just remember the entering and the leaving time for each thing as you do the window. Ticket completed. Um, this is, a, I guess, a classic graph problem with just a little bit of a probability uh, uh, thing at the very end. So what you want to do first is you want to somehow uh, establish the connected components of the graph. So um, because uh, it, the answer is the number of pairs of nodes that lie in the same connected component divided by the total number of pairs of nodes. So if you establish the connected components or if some way for each vertex, you know which component it's in. And ultimately what you want is the size of the connected components. So if you can get the sizes of the connected components, well, it's just the number of pairs of nodes within that component, summed over all components, divided by the number of pairs of nodes in total. And that's it. So it's just getting the sizes of the connected components. That's the, uh, the algorithmic part of this. Uh, I saw a few time limit exceeded solutions in this one. Um, because even though connected components were correctly established, there was just a uh, running over all pairs of nodes within each component uh, to count their size. So just use a little formula instead, like, you know, C choose two. Wordle of friends is one of those ones where there's not really a lot of algorithmic, like there's no fancy algorithms required to solve it, but it can be tricky to get the, uh, the specific rules right for checking whether something is consistent or not. So there's no, there's no real tricks to this apart from uh, getting this detail correct. For each candidate in the dictionary, check whether each guess's feedback is consistent with the candidate word or not. So in other words, is the candidate still a candidate after you've compared against all the feedback? Um, that's just sitting through them, just sitting through the rules and making sure you implement it well. And, um, and that's it, I guess, if, if, for, if, you, if the feedback is consistent for all guesses out, we're good. No tricky algorithms required, just delicate implementation. Look at chess. So this, is, this slide is a little bit full. That's um, so you can browse it a bit at the end. 
But loot chest, I was happy to see at least six teams solve this one. Sometimes probability questions can be a bit daunting. Uh, before we talk about the solution though, let's recall one basic principle. So if you have, let's say you have a coin and you toss it and the probability of being heads is actually P instead of 50-50, so like 0.1 or 0.2. How many times do you have to toss the coin until you see heads? Well, how many times in expectation? Um, you can calculate it to be one over P. There's a few different ways to calculate it to see that. And at some point you just internalize that this is the calculation. So it's good to remember this because we can, we can break the problem down into two steps. The first step is, what's the expected number of packs to open until you get a prize? So every time you open a pack, it's like you're tossing a coin with this probability of heads, with this probability of actually getting the gorilla suit that you want. So the expected number of times that you need to open a prize pack is this. Uh, so, the, so, the, so the second half of the question is, what's the expected number of games you play until you open a prize pack? Because every time you open a prize pack and don't get the gorilla suit, you go back to P equals zero. So it's just like the very start. So we've got this calculation, but now we have to multiply it by the expected number of guesses until you open a prize pack. Um, this, can, this is a dynamic programming problem, albeit it's not too, the, the hard part is just getting used to the probabilities. The actual recurrence isn't so bad. This is a bit messy to fit on the slide, but you can browse it later. Um, but, but let's put it this way. If P is already 100, well then it's just the expected number of games till you win. And then we are again going to use this principle because this is the probability you have of winning a game right here. This is the probability of winning. So that's just like tossing coins yet again. So when P equals 100, you're tossing coins until you win the game. Um, otherwise, if P is less than 100, we know that every either a win or a loss will advance P up by one. So there, it does go to a sub problem. We can just write a direct recurrence for this. So the base case is this, the recurrence is given by this. Um, I'll quickly talk through this. Um, Maybe it'll be more useful when you review the video, but the way that I derived this recurrence was that if my probability is P, well, then I play a game. Again, this is the expected number of turns until you open a pack. So this, if my probability is P, I pay, play a game. Either I lose with this probability, in which case it goes up like this, or I win. And if I open a prize pack, great. I don't have to play any more games till the next prize pack, or I lose and I go up like this. Um, and the only th other thing to mention here is these terms here, you should really cap them at 100. So you should really use something like this. So probability and dynamic programming together, the recurrence isn't, um, isn't uh, too crazy, but you do just have to understand how the game evolves based on the different things that could possibly happen. Snowball fight. Snowball fight is, a, is an odd one because it can be solved in constant time, in fact. The numbers are really big. It's kind of a messy problem, but there is a simple constant time. Well, sorry, there is a constant time solution where the idea behind it is simple, but fleshing it out does take some attention to detail. So if you do single step simulation, it's too slow. The numbers are huge there. there are, I forget what the maximum was. Was it like 64 bit numbers almost? Something like that. They were close to that. But you look for patterns though. Don't just do single step simulation. For example, if these are the health of the forts, then in fact, if you simulate this many steps, like, uh, so don't just do a single step simulation, but for all of these steps, we have that C would go down by two and B would go down by one. Because as long as this happens, C gets attacked by both A and B and C would attack B. And you'll notice that if you go down by this many steps, um, you can take care of many rounds of simulation with one calculation. And then after this, uh, either A, the new A equals the new B or the new B equals the new C. And then, then you think, oh, well, what does it look like now? So you think of these different phases of the game when they're spread apart, when two are equal or close, and the game squishes down to, you know, I guess, more structured sub games. And you just think in each case, what's a fast way to do the simulation, even in constant time. There are a few details in the bullet points here that I won't, uh, I won't drag out in this discussion. But if you're looking for at least one possible way to break the game down into these different phases, you can go through these. There's a number of cases to check, but. Um, but it does run in constant time at the end. Just as an implementation detail though, we saw quite a few teams submitting problems, submitting solutions where they just had different if statements, whether A, B, or C was the biggest one, for example. Um, one handy thing is to just um, keep track of the of like a struct that stores the health and the label of the fort. Then you can sort that struct by, by the remaining health. 
Um, and then you don't have to worry about different cases, whether it's A, the biggest or B, the biggest. You just look at the, the way that struct is sorted and simulate those. Then ultimately, whichever one of those things uh, survives is, uh, is um, you just look at the label associated with the value. But that's just an implementation trick. So as you can see, there's two slides of different rules to follow. Again, um, we'll leave this here. And if you have any questions about it as you try to work through it yourself later, if you're trying to upsolve this problem, feel free to, to ping us in Discord. Protect the pollen. Um, in some sense, this was a bit of a, what we call a standard dynamic programming problem in a tree. There's, a, there's not a lot to say about, uh, about uh, really, really, you just have to form the DP table and then do it. So for each node, let this be a DP table entry. That's the largest total pollination power possible. If for the subtree rooted at R and the total size of the selected families in S and B is indicating whether or not R must be skipped. So if we had chosen the parent of R to get to the sub problem, B would indicate that, or B would indicate we're allowed to choose R. But with these three tables, you can write this as some function of what's going on with the children. So at each node, if you combine the answers from subtrees, um, it's a knapsack problem that runs in this time. So the, I guess the details of that recurrence are left out, but just think of how to split it between the two different children. Um, one of the, I guess one of the annoyances about it is that there could be more than one, more than two children, but then you just build them up from left to right. We've left a few details out of these slides, but we just hope that the picture is, uh, is, uh, is helpful enough to get you to write the recurrence. Uh, fully yourself and to implement. Again, use Discord if you're working through a problem and you just can't quite get it. Team change. All right. So with team change, um, ultimately this is a network flow problem. So what we, the way I like to think about it is uh, from the input, you know if a vertex or player. So I'm going to think of it as a graph with vertices being players and edges being conflicts between players. You know, label each vertex as they must change, they must try, must not change or don't matter. So based on their current team and their uh, preferred team, if they have one, we can label them this way. So let's think about what a solution looks like here. If we delete some players, it's possible to, uh, the, here's, the, here's the statement that, uh, that I focused on at least. If you deleted some players, it's possible to form teams if and only if each component in the resulting graph does not have both a must change and must not change player. That's because, well, for every edge, either both team, both members, uh, both, both of the vertices at the endpoints of the edge will have to change or they will not change because they, they were already on opposite teams and they must remain on opposite teams. So they both must change or they, or they, they, they will both change teams or they will both not change teams in a valid team formation. So again, after deleting some players slash nodes, you can form teams if and only if each component doesn't have both a must change node and a must not change node. And this is a, um, at this point, it's a classic minimum vertex cut problem in a graph, which you can solve with flow. And uh, we set the bounds so that even um, the simplest of flow algorithms would be fast enough for this problem because we were more concerned about with you seeing it as a flow problem than you, uh, than, uh, than worrying about, are you using the fastest, uh, the fast enough flow algorithm. Trade routes. Trade routes is a bit of a deceptive problem because there's, there's some insight to see a greedy algorithm, but then once you see it, you might be tempted to go and implement it. But unless you take extra care in the implementation, it'll be too slow. But the greedy algorithm itself is correct. Let's, uh, what do I mean by the greedy algorithm? If you process the routes in order of value from greatest to leadest, least, um, and then added the current route that you're considering to the set of chosen routes if you're allowed to. So in other words, add the routes from most valuable to least valuable, as long as adding that route leaves a feasible solution. That is in principle a correct algorithm. It's just a little too slow. There's a, um, if you don't uh, take extra care to, on how you'll uh, implement it. If you just did it naively, just by checking the path up to the root for each node you're trying, it's too slow. So the idea is to push the solution upward. Let me just do a little sketch here. So if this is representing a node and these are its children, what we're gonna do is we're gonna imagine pushing all the nodes that we'll use in the solution upwards. So all the trade routes, I should say. All the trade routes we'll use in the solution will push upwards. So suppose for each of these, we've solved the problem as if this was row. 
So for each of these nodes, we know the best nodes that can be pushed upwards to it subject to the constraints down here at least. We do this for each thing. So right now, if this node was wrong, we have the best solution to that. To compute the best solution for this, we just look at all of the all the ones that made it here so far. So all the all the trade routes that that did make it up to these to its children nodes, plus the new trade route here, and we'll take the b sub j most valuable of them if uh, if this is j. So among all the trade routes that made it here, and this trade route, take the b sub j most valuable, or all of them if there's less than b sub j. This is still a little too. This is still too slow because this is still quadratic. If you're not careful about it, think of just a really long graph like this, where you just um, uh, with, with high capacity. So you're just going to be pushing a bulk of things up one at a time. So most of them will go half the will will go like theta n distance. So this is still a little too slow, but there's only one more trick that's required. So when we're considering which ones to push up here, let's just um. Let's just look at uh, picking one at a time. So the way I like to think of it is that these are maybe, there's a few different ways to do it, but maybe this is a, a heap of nodes that have reached so far. And so let's just look at these two here. So this has a heap of, sorry, of trade routes that reached here. This is a heap of trade routes. And um, what we're gonna do is instead, instead of just adding everything from this heap to this heap, and then cutting it off if it's too big, I'm gonna see which of these two heaps is the smallest. And I'm going to add from the smaller to the larger instead. So that might lead to fewer movements of items from one heap to the next. So I might, if this is smaller than this, then I'm going to move things here. And I'm going to let this one represent the heap here. So in general, you can view the solution as merging a bunch of heaps or some other container to hold items. And I want you to think about merging, the, taking the ones from the smaller and adding them to the larger. If you do that, every time you have to combine two things, if you always add the smaller to the larger, then every item will only be moved log n times because every time it moves to a new thing, that thing's size is at least twice what it was in before. So this is the final trick. If you do this, always moving the smaller to the larger and then letting the larger of the two represent what was the point of merging these two, then every item moves at most log n times. So the total running time is n log squared n. Every item moves log n times. Whenever it does it, it's log n time because it's a binary heap or, not, or an ordered set or something. And finally, um, that will be for every item. So there's n items. It is possible to do this in n log n time, but it's hard to do it uh, by just relying on standard libraries. This idea was fast enough, and it's all that I have in my solution. And finally, anti-aliases. So for each... Uh, the idea behind this is quite straightforward. In fact, it's just a geometry problem. And of course, it takes some, you know, takes some fortitude to address problems like this. But, but you can solve this one just by using code library code on it, as long as you use it carefully. So for each query, just there's four boundary, four boundary segments for that pixel. One segment, one segment, one segment, one segment. You can repeatedly clip the polygon against these segments here. Um, just when you do it, take the exact use the, the exact arithmetic to give fractions of, instead of um, instead of the the doubles that your library is probably implemented in. So you'll probably have to change the type that's being used in your library to use fractions. So maybe you can just implement a C plus plus fraction class or use the built-in fractions in Python. Something, but um, just just do your standard geometric calculations uh, using exact arithmetic though. Um, Another way you could do this is um, for every square, you're essentially computing the, the area of intersection between that square and some polygon. Uh, one can use a generic area of intersection code that runs in, well, uh, n times m time, where, where n and m are the sizes of the two polygons, because that would be linear time because one polygon only has four sides. So you could use that as well. Um, but it is possible to solve this just using basic uh, geometric primitives too. Um, just make sure you port things over to use fractions. So that's my high level summary of this. Of course, any of us judges are more than happy to answer questions people might have about this. Um, so please don't be shy in using Discord or reaching out to one of us to, to, to ask questions because we want to help you up solve these problems. Thank you.
And that's it for my end. So as far as uh, uh, the teams, or I, I suppose the coaches, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask right now or about the problem sets? minutes ago after the contest. Warren, show. we don't have any questions, but one of our students asked if the problems will be on open on the open part of CADIS. And I think it usually takes a week or two, but they will be, correct? Yeah, they will be. It might be faster than that. They've been pretty fast lately about the conversion. We'll see. But we'll post on Discord when they're there. And uh, the panel of uh, the NEICPC Discord. And so. uh, I think we also plan to be uh, publishing some of our judges solutions as well. So that along with this talk that we have and then our sample solutions, you can uh, you can put the two together and try to figure things out. Then if you need help, of course, yes, yeah, access, uh, just ping us on Discord. Mm -hmm. So in the, the usual way we publish these days is to put them in a uh, repository that I believe you get a link off of icpc.global um, in when the problem set is resolved. And, um, and I can certainly just, again, just post a link to the Discord IO channel um, when that's available. And I, I thought I saw I, BYU team maybe pop up, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. I don't know if that was a question or not. I think that was just us unmuting. I'm using the BYU site to, otherwise there's feedback. This is Ryan. Got it. Okay, great. Um, then, um, I, Ryan, let's hear. So how do we, uh, how would you like to go through the resolver? It, so I believe the idea was you were going to run the resolver. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, I'll do that. Let me just share my screen. But it's going to take uh, about four and a half minutes to run through um, the last, I can't remember, 100 and some odd submissions. But let me, everybody can see it. So then, uh, I guess, uh, judges, would you guys like to maybe do the commentary as, as we run through that set? Since you got to see the, the last play by play. Hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Once it's going, uh, Zach and Howard, I'll turn it over to you guys. Okay, so this is the status before uh, at the at the time of the freeze, and I, Zach, are you willing to start walking through this? Give me one second. Um, well, I don't have control over the the keyboard here. Brian, your keyboard. Okay, Ryan, you're doing keyboard control, right? Keyboard. I, I can narrate. Uh, you can just feel free. I won't say. I won't say go. I'll just. I'll just narrate as we go. <laughs> so, um, uh, I, I tune. So the way I, I tuned out for a second. Did you explain how this resolver will work? No. Well, anyway, so you can see here. It's just showing the problems get resolved. The problems after the freeze of the scoreboard, and so it'll highlight the problem and then show you if they got it after the freeze or not. 
So these are various submissions. So for example, that one was judged correct. Yep, so it's, it's very exciting. And I, I think the resolver will slow down as we get closer to the top here. And then Lethbridge here with one submission. Not accepted. Nice. Montana Tech though got D. Whoa. You seem to be having a little. Uh... That's on their side. I can't do anything about it. It's the uh, sharing. Nicely done. There's quite a bit of submission still after the freeze. Eh? It was. It was. That was uh, exciting for us to watch as well. No quality bad for everybody else. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, it is. Quite the mind. Yeah, there's something something up with the feed from there, but uh, it's readable, and I think that'll have to be okay. I picked it to try to make the video faster, but somehow it's doing that. Well, that's okay though. This is a good speed. Each team is important. It's fun to watch. Develop there we go. Very good. One. Azure on problem P and then the I. Very good. Okay. BYU. Attack. If anyone else has things to say, go for it too. I'm uh, not the greatest show person. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking like one thing that uh, we have is a number of teams from the same schools. So I will point out that there is a, uh, I will call it a diversity rule in ICPC to prefer uh, different campuses. So if there is a tie of campuses. Um, there's one team per campus that goes that's promoted. So uh, might want to keep that in mind, considering how many how many teams there are from from same campuses. Oh, and I think because I think it's slowing down here because it's going to tell us that. Uh, yep. No way. Yeah, the, the 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 top team in that division. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Very cool. Gonna, while it's paused here, I'm gonna try to just reshare the screen so hopefully the resolution improves. One sec. This isn't the end. No, this isn't the end. <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to we're trying to improve the resolution of the, of the share. Yeah, optimize to video. Oh, there we go. Look at that. That's beautiful. Wow, that is quite a bit better. Okay. There, now we can read it too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Colorado Mines. It's 3 a.m. somewhere on problem N. Very good. Nice. And G was a tricky one. Nicely done, U of A Green. Nice. They have one, and they're stuck. We're gonna go back one, nope. And one, two, one, oh, okay, good, number 12. Okay. All right, it's now top 12 here, left bridge. Oh. oh. Yeah, so for people who aren't used to this, at the World Finals, they hand out four golds, four silver, four bronze, and the resolver is, I guess, uh, scheduled to do that. I don't believe we're handing out physical medals here at the RMR. <laughs> we, have, we haven't done that before. But the bronze medal winner, one of the bronze medal winners in this region. <laughs> Very nice. And wrong answer, did not live up, live up to its name. There we go. <laughs> and bronze medal winner, runtime error. 
eighth problems. They, see, we're we're already in the it's just it's it's uh, around the top ten. We're still already solving eight problems. That's it's quite the volume. It's a yeah. lot of code that people produced this year. Very nice. No, oh, we lost the resolution again. Mine's eight. Congratulations. Wonder how that resets. We'll have to talk a little bit afterwards. Code Frogs Calgary, eight problems. Congratulations. Now we're in the silvers. So I will point out, at, we still do not know how many people will promote, mm -hmm. uh, but it will probably not be this number, number of people. I, I will say some, somewhere between two and three is the likely result. Congratulations, rule of three. Algonauts, ooh. Very, very, very good. Nine problems. That's awesome. The winner group of the Colorado School of Mines. Nice. Got two submissions from Calgary after the freeze. From Code Toads. No. And okay. Congratulations, Code Toads. Yes. <laughs> I like our worker on. <laughs> <laughs> JT squared from uh, Brigham Young. Did we get problem M? We did not. No, I said no, no. Ten problems. That's that's a, that's very impressive. Gold medal. First to solve on problem J as well. Brigham Young not on anti-aliasing and not on M. So. First to solve those three problems as well, D, J, and N. And then did Alberta Aqua get anti-aliasing? Boom, they got anti-aliasing. Wow, excellent work. Only what, nine submissions? But nine submissions and you get it, that's great. So, Please join me in congratulating everyone here, and, and in particular, Aqua, BYU Star, and who knows if we have others going to the NAC. So thank you very uh, Congratulate them all. Yes. Congratulations, everybody. Good job. Um, and, I, and, you know, the, uh, one thing I try to say about the contest is, yes, there are people that promote, and that is a great thing. Um, and I also hope that uh, it's something that's a fun puzzle to work with. And hopefully we also have more and more people that can participate in person as, uh, as we move forward. So I hope that's been a great uh, event for the people that got to be in one. Um, and uh, let's see here, a couple, a couple of sales pitch moments I have to do. One is um, you're a student. Um, we definitely you know, always are looking for people who are interested in helping with a contest. So as you sort of matric matriculate out of being a contestant, um, consider being a coach. Um, if you've been a coach, consider being a judge and then, and then sort of et cetera, right? There's, there's just plenty of effort and time that goes into making these contests actually work. And so if you like this sort of stuff, we would love to see kind of a, a long-term participation in other ways. Um, as team members, uh, there's the ICPCIO and, of course, other places to uh, maybe work on uh, becoming better at these, if that's a, a way that you'd like to participate. And so we would encourage you to try to do those things, too. Um, and, of course, uh, just a thanks to all the people that have helped make this happen this year. Um, anybody else want to add anything to that?
Very good, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Um, great, great appreciation from our side.